Let's start by uh, covering what we're going to, how we're going to spend our time. Uh, I will introduce us. That will be about 25 minutes, um, probably a little less. And then Rael will do our deep dive. So, so let's go to the intro section. Uh, Docs is the largest Kubernetes SIG. I say this with some pride and perhaps with some skepticism from your part. How could documentation be the largest SIG? The answer is that everyone is a part of it. But we'll also come back to that in a moment. And we'll say more about uh, the size of documentation. But for now, we'll talk a little bit about why docs matter. And docs matter because docs drive adoption. Without good documentation, without any documentation, it would be much, dif much more difficult, if not impossible, to use Kubernetes at all, to explain to others how to use it, and to use it more widely. So docs drive adoption. And that's uh, why we exist, is to help people uh, use, uh, to start using and continue using Kubernetes successfully. And adoption matters because in open source, adoption changes the balance of power in a community. The more people who adopt and begin using Kubernetes because it is an open source software project means that all of a sudden, instead of just being a user of Kubernetes, you are a developer of Kubernetes as well. You are a part of the community. And that means that all of a sudden, you are not just a passive consumer. You are someone who changes the shape of Kubernetes, the features that are included, the features that are developed. So adoption drives shifts in power. And documentation is how people become members and contributors and participants in Kubernetes. Docs also signal and drive inclusion. When we come into an open source project, one of the first things that we need to know is what kind of a community is this like? Is this a community where I can be a safe person? Uh, and the code of conduct helps to drive that. But if the code of conduct is not in alignment with the documentation, if what we say we do versus how we actually do it, if these things don't match, then there's not a, uh, there is a, a feeling of danger. There is no perception of safety. So docs drive inclusion, safety and inclusion. And inclusive communities create and contribute to inclusive docs. When we as contributors feel safe in a community, we create documentation that reflects our values, that reflects who we are. So, Fun fact about Kubernetes documentation right now, uh, we have nine different localizations. We have English, nine other languages, and two more languages currently in development. And this is pretty awesome. We spent the last year uh, paying down technical debt and making it possible to host Kubernetes documentation in a multitude of localizations. And uh, Part of driving adoption means making docs available in folks' own languages. So to give you a sense of the impact of SIG docs, our website, kubernetes.io, in April, we averaged 1.2 million page views per week. That's kind of big. Every time I think about it, uh, my imposter syndrome has a giant flare-up. Uh, <laughs> but it's pretty amazing to realize that the impact of SIG docs individually impacts 1.2 million page views per week. So the work that we do in documentation matters a great deal. Docs matter. So uh, Rael will cover a little more of our, about our tooling and our, how our website is built uh, in the deep dive. But I just want to mention briefly that uh, our our workflow and our tool chain for the website is pretty straightforward. 
we build the website using Netlify from a GitHub repository. And contributors to the website, to documentation, uh, work in the repository the same way that feature developers work in other repositories in Kubernetes. We have more or less an identical workflow. So we are very much a part of the Kubernetes community. And contributing in any Kubernetes project uh, makes it possible for you to contribute to documentation just as easily. We use Prow. There is um, nothing unique. We don't use a, a different set of bots. Uh, so the same Prow commands that you use in other Kubernetes SIG repos are the same ones that we use in website. So one of the things that we do in SIG docs is that we support the Kubernetes quarterly release cycle. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, Kubernetes releases on a quarterly basis. And uh, SIG docs uh, drives and coordinates all of the documentation. Every user-facing feature change, uh, feature addition, uh, that uh, is required to have a documentation update. And uh, if you are a feature developer, actually, just a really quick show of hands, who here has developed a feature for Kubernetes? Who's worked on a feature? OK. Uh, who here is interested in, uh, has anyone com contributed uh, to Kubernetes before? Interesting. Cool. Um, so what we do as part of the quarterly release cycle is make sure that if there is a feature that has a user affecting impact, that that change gets noted. And we coordinate all of that and make sure that the website is updated, that the documentation is updated whenever a feature changes. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, Docs is the largest Kubernetes SIG. And that is because everyone is a member. If you use the website, you are participating in SIG Docs. If you find something on the website that is not accurate, and you say, hey, that's wrong. I've got to complain about that. I've got an open issue. You're a member of SIG Docs. If you develop a feature that has a user-facing impact, you're a member of SIG Docs. If you open a fe uh, pull request <coughs> to fix a typo or a broken link, you're a member of SIG Docs. So uh, we are the largest SIG because we are the world. We are everyone. We are everywhere. We see everything. Just kidding. We, we only see most things. <laughs> uh, but in this case, while we're the largest SIG, uh, size is misleading. Right now, we, out of all of SIG docs, we have uh, two full-time and one part-time technical writer uh, dedicated to documentation quality. So while we have a lot of people involved in documentation, our ability to meaningfully um, improve and uh, uh, do things like make better information architecture, uh, make sure that our site UX is good or, or uh, conforming to accessibility standards. Uh, right now, we're stretched pretty thin. And uh, we need more writers. Uh, the golden ratio for technical writers to developers, usually 1 to 7 to 1 to 12, depending on uh, how much user-facing fa user feature development is happening. Uh, if you're doing a lot of user-facing development, probably closer to 1 to 7, one technical writer for every seven developers. If it's mostly back-end stuff, eh, probably closer to 1 to 12. Right now, in Kubernetes, the ratio of technical writers to feature developers is closer to 1 to 150. So that makes it a little difficult to do things like ensure that all of the documentation has really good quality conformance. And that matters because it's easy to get involved with SIG docs, either as an individual contributor or as a CNCF partner. So individual contributors make existing content better. And individual contributors do this by things like writing new content. If you're a feature developer, uh, you can help localize. If you speak another language other than English and you want to make uh, documentation available in your language, you can help localize. If you're a CNCF partner, uh, a company that is a member of the CNCF, you can also contribute by hiring more technical writers. It's a theme. 
that I will repeat as often as I can get people uh, to listen to me. Hire more technical writers, please. And even if you don't hire more writers, provide support for developers who do documentation. Uh, if you have developers who are working in an open source project, but you don't allot time for them, uh, that's, kind of, that's, a, that's exploitative. Make sure that if you are benefiting from an open source project, that you're providing a means for them to support and contribute back. So support developers who also write documentation. Make sure that they have the support to document the features uh, that they create. Uh, our contributors are amazing. Uh, in SIGDOCS, I have the privilege of uh, being someone who helps open the world to Kubernetes and uh, making it as easy as possible for as many people as possible to learn Kubernetes, to begin contributing themselves, and to grow. And that is a powerful, powerful thing. And it wouldn't happen without individual contributors who helped make everything go, who helped make the website work, who contribute to back-end development, who contribute to content. So thank you. And now I'm going to hand it over to Rael, who will do our deep dive. OK. Thank you, Zach. So um, I joined the Kubernetes project in the last uh, in the last two months as a member. Before uh, being a, becoming a member, I was only reviewing, helping, checking how the documentation were, going through all the documentation to see how it's managed, what how is the concepts split across different subjects, and after being that was. The best way to get into the Kubernetes community was going through the documentation and afterwards using a managed solution or, or your custom solution or building on premises. Documentation is the core thing to allow everyone in this room, everyone in this, that uses Kubernetes to really uh, take advantage of all the, that Kubernetes provides. So um, how we work in, in Six Dogs is through uh, a tool set to deploy web pages as code and also to allow the same flows that we use to core contributions in documentation. So every contributor has the same framework to uh, make pull requests and be part of contributing to the code. So uh, how many people in this room knows Hugo? OK, and how many people knows that what is a static framework for webs, like Jekyll or, or similar? So um, Hugo and the other frameworks allow having uh, plain text content written in Markdown be rendered as a building artifact. So you have your code, and you go through a pipeline that builds an artifact with the content, the style, the images, packs everything into a regular web page that can run in Apache, in Nginx, or any other uh, web server. And this page will be a static, not dynamic. That allows an increase in performance because everything can be catched in a custom DB network. And also security, because uh, you cannot hack an static page. You need to go through all the pull requests and all the validations that are running inside the Kubernetes community. For example, WordPress. WordPress are a very dangerous content management system because of this. So having this kind of uh, platform allows us to keep secure the platform and avoid like misleading content or just bad content in, in the website. Everything is plain text, and where is the best uh, place to store plain text that works like code. That's GitHub. Um, all the projects right now in Kubernetes runs in GitHub. We have more than 192 projects currently and 31,000 contributors across all of them. For example, um, the website has 443 issues open. Issues can be or like parts of a project like creating 
allowing internationalization to the site, or an issue uh, of someone that has spotted a, a problem but is not able to fix it. And she opened a new issue so any other contributor can grab, grab the issue and start working on the problem via pull request. Also allow us to work on project milestones. For example, currently we only manage the Kubernetes.ai website, that is the main, but Kubernetes has a lot of projects. For example, kubectl, or kubectl, or kubectl, as you wish. Um, Minikube, Kind, uh, Customize, there is a lot of tooling around Kubernetes. So, um, we try to get projects like covering sub-projects or internationalization a subset because not everyone uses Hugo. So this issues allow us to have a project in Kanban that everyone can check and go to a Kanban process from to do to ongoing and organize between ourselves. So if you have a project, you can split in the several issues and go through a regular Kanban process to get the things done. And to split the work between uh, as much contributors as you can. Another thing that is good of being in GitHub is that we standardize, in, standardize the way to get into the community. Every project, every contributor goes to the same web page, to the same site, to the same workflow. And that helps a lot to switch between code contributions to content contributions and back and forward. If you deploy a new feature, as Zach told you before, you can go to docs, run the same process as you did for your feature, and get the things done. And that's key when you have a community as big as Kubernetes. Last thing, GitHub is where we store the code. Hugo is the framework that we use to build as an artifact the page. But Netify is the content delivery network that distributes and builds uh, the web page. Every time you make a pull request, uh, continuous integration pipeline will be triggered, and an artifact with your version of the website, so the upstream more your, plus your changes will be deployed in an ephemeral environment. So you can check before public, pu, public, publicizing uh, the sites, the, the site online, if the changes that we are doing are, are okay, are good, doesn't break the changes. And also for the reviewers and the prover that we go to your pull request, can check how it will look on the, on the, print, on the main page. After this pull request is completed, you will merge the content into master, and another pipeline will do the same thing. Build an artifact and update the main site for Kubernetes. It usually takes less than five minutes to get your content after a merge. And that's another thing that is important when you have this kind of size of community. Building automation around all your pipelines. Trying to remove the human factor as, as much as possible, because it's hard to manage, it's hard to put governance in this case of uh, validation. So everything has to be done by a robot. In this case, uh, we have Kubernetes bot in GitHub that is running on Prow. Uh, Prow, that is our continuous integration uh, engine that we built uh, the Kubernetes for from, from the six uh, testing team. Uh, from this one, anyone knew what was Netify before? First time? Netify, it's free for open source projects. So if you want to have your website public, it's, you can use the same thing. It's, it's a great tool and it's helping a lot to Kubernetes because it handles 1.2 million page views per week. So it, it's ready to, to grow, to scale. So. Now you have the tool set. You know what do you need to use to be part and build uh, the Kubernetes project. How you can start contributing to Kubernetes. Anyone wants to try? What is the first thing that you should do if you want to join uh, to the six dog group? Yet, that's correct. Uh, documentation. If you want to be part of documentation, you need to know the documentation. So the first thing you need to know is go through the website, view all the pages, view all the content, try to find topics that interest to you or you are an expert. For example, we have in this room the, the maintainer of the Jinx Ingress controller. So go there and put your knowledge and share your knowledge with the rest of the people. 
or if you find a type of you, you are running a demo project that you can, you think that might be interesting, you can publish a blog post, or you can run a lab and write the lab here. You will reach one, two point million page views per week. So your content can be there. You only need to know where to put it. If that looks right, you have two things to do. First, reading the contributors guide from, from the SIG contributor experience. There you will know how to get in the community, the code of content that we have, and all the steps that you need to get things started. Once you need the community, the next thing is reading our uh, contributor guideline. You will see how we manage all the deployments, the style guides that we use to, uh, sh to keep everything written in the same way, and also uh, our meetings, how we manage changes, and all our pipelines. So, I'm just know how to contribute and how to be part of docs. If you are still interested after all this information, next thing is go into Slack. I probably Kubernetes has the most, the biggest channel in the Slack. We have Kubernetes users with more than, I think we are almost 70,000 users. 70,000 users in a Slack channel. Can be overwhelming, but everyone in the channel is willing to help. So. Don't be afraid of joining, getting to know people. If, if you are interested in a particular subject, go to the SIG channel, see who is talking, get to know the chairs, the people that is more active this week, because it's a, it's a huge project. You can have weeks with a lot of interaction and take a holiday next week. So get to know people and ask. Be part of the, the, all the conversations. Reach the, uh, by the direct message some folk if you need some assistance. Don't hesitate to ask for help because everyone in this community is willing to help. Uh, who, from this room, are you all in Slack? Is there anyone that is not currently in Slack? Raise your hand if you are not in Slack. Then we will go there and we will add you to Slack. It's important. You can look around. You don't need to be part of the discussion. Just Get the chat, you will learn a lot. I'm in users in English and also in Spanish. And I am the sick of Amazon Web Services, I am the thing of Azure, I am the thing of World Cloud, not as a contributor, but as, as a learner. But I learn problems that people have that troubleshoot there, and all that knowledge can be useful for you, for your daily Kubernetes things, or also for adding documentation, improving documentation. You can spot some flaws in the documentation if the same thing gets asked over and over in a particular user group. So be part of the discussions. And the next thing, once you are in a Slack, is Git. Uh, currently, the website has over 12,000 commits. And the main repo, I think it's over 76,000. So we use Git a lot. So if you need help with Git, the same as before. Everyone in the community is willing to help. I run more than 10 uh, uh, like hands-on from uh, Hangout, Zoom meetings, just to help setting things up, just to help like working uh, with a rebase or troubleshooting a conflict. So if you have a problem with Git, the same. Ask for help, look in the SIG channel, Look in the C contributor experience. We have a, a lot of documentation. Of if, this don't, if the documentation doesn't work, we can improve it. And in the meantime, we can help you. We, can, we do meetings on a daily basis. So it's not a problem to run a 10 minutes uh, chat over the Skype. First thing that you need, once you like, lose the, the, the fear of Git, for the repo. You have this big button there that allows you to have a copy in your namespace, in your GitHub namespace, because master is restricted to owners. Only owners and the bot can write into master. Everyone else needs to go to his fork. And that makes sense. When you have a uh, 1,000, well, most, mostly 2,000 users, you cannot have as user management inside the repo. It, it just doesn't work. You need that. Work in the fork, and then the pull request will get you into the, the pull request. So, 
How many people forget a repo, a public repo, during his lifetime? Everyone, per perfect. This, this step is covered. Once you have your repo, you have to download the repo to work on it. It's not really required. You can, uh, with the last version of GitHub, you can edit things in the browser. So you can edit the file with the, um, with the web based editor, make a branch there, make a pull request, and do all the flow without leaving the browser. In case you are working on a table or your tablet, or you need look just to add a quick fix. Go to a page, add the quick fix on the website, make the pull request, and move over. But if you want to make a bigger contribution, or you need to change a page, or add a new one, or request some interaction, or just you are more comfortable with uh, working with your editor, there are, for example, for Visual Studio Code, uh, we have a lot of plugins that has spare checkers, translation on the same editor. So you can select a phrase, translate to your language, and then like try to work if the phrase doesn't make, make sense. So there is a lot of ways, a lot of tools to localize content. So feel free or choose the one you, you like the most. You have the repo, you have everything locally. The good thing that having all the content in Markdown is that you can read offline the content. You can get the page, it's a readable page. If you have um, some disability and you need some tool like spec, uh, text to speech or some helper, it's plain text. You can put the, the text in your tool and be able to read the language. Everything, all the image has, has captions, so can provide some content if you can see the image. But there is also a way to have locally offline all the content. And the content can be built locally. You don't need, you don't need the Netify. You will show a bit more on that afterwards. So you have the website locally. You know what to change. The next thing is uh, creating a branch. This is important. Kubernetes uh, with 12,000 commits is a quite paced project. You can file, I think, 25 merge a day, probably. So your master keeps updated like a lot. The safest way to work with any public repo, any open source uh, project, is to have your own branch. Work on your own branch and make your history in that branch. If there is a conflict, it's easier if you are working on, on a branch that you are working in master. And a lot of the initial problems that the folks have when, start and could, when they start contributing is they work on, on branch and that is Git. So you know when 2,000 people is working in the same branch, that can lead some some problems. That's, um, yeah, you make, check out the, the new branch, make the commits, work on the content that you want. It, it's not a bad practice, have several pro uh, commits during the, um, the work in progress, because it's easier to you to see all the things that you are doing and keep track of all the changes. But after the review process, it's recommended to squash all the commits in, in a single one and leave all the commit message in a list. Because again, it's a 12,000 commit project. So if we can save some commits, it will be worth it in the long time. So you have your repo, you have your branch, you commit your changes, everything looks what, at least in the Visual Studio Code or the editor that you choose, how you can check how it looks locally without triggering all the pipeline. Ugo is a tool that can be run locally. It's a binary within Go. You can download the binary. A, there is a Docker image that you can run if you, don't, if you prefer um, running inside a container. And a good thing of Ugo is that watches the changes. So you can uh, spawn a Ugo process, have this in background, start working on the code. Uh, every time you add a new page or you edit content, Ugo will, re will rebuild in the background the page. That's really, really useful to see how the changes will be, because Markdown has some format. And it's hard to see how it looks without rendering the page. Um, as you can see here, we have 
I uh, think about eight languages. First one is English with 1,000 pages. And the next one is China and Korean with 200. And we are the fourth one, Spain with 90, 97 pages. That's not bad at all because Kubernetes project in Spanish has been there uh, for uh, two months, I think. So there is people willing to help. There is a lot of contributors that are working on the project. You see that people know that that is important and that's why uh, they are working on it. For example, uh, Eduard Medina is, is an engineer from Valencia that has been working, uh, working with Kubernetes for the last two years. When, she, when he knew that Kubernetes was starting the, the Spanish project, he jumped into it because he was so graceful all of the documentation of all the, um, the change in his life that is providing Kubernetes and all, all this na, na cloud native landscape that he, I think I have a pull request from, from her from, uh, from his, uh, the last uh, two weeks with 4,000 lines of documentation. Uh, and it's a uh, long, but the, the intention is there. The people is willing to spend a lot of time writing documentation in Spanish. Um, the reviewers are there uh, willing to spend a lot of time reviewing the content and learning during the process because the best way to learn something is to explain the, the concept to another person that doesn't know as much as you. That is like the only true way of learning something. When you are able to explain to someone that is not used to the concept. And you learn a lot here because you read each phrase like 10, 12 times uh, and you have to like put yourself in the situation of someone that doesn't know as much as you. And can be hard, but then when you start like getting in the mood, you see things that you thought you knew but you don't need as well as you think, as you thought, sorry. And the same for the different projects. We have some folks here from the French, uh, um, the French, uh, press uh, the people managing the French localization. And the Spanish, we have a couple of folks that came to the last Spanish event, I think Jose Luis, and David also was part of the Spanish. So people is here, people is willing to, and how was the, the experience? Can you say, how do you feel when you saw your content in a one to four million page? Yeah, you can make a footprint in the Kubernetes project, a footprint that can be so, but thousands of millions of people. Uh, another important thing that we found when we started the, the Spanish localization project is people jumped into the Slack channel for the Spanish user being over, um, graceful for the content, saying that um, they felt that they, can, they, weren't, they weren't able to explain the problems in English because Kubernetes is a complex project. And when you have to troubleshoot, not being able to do in your own words, it's a hard problem. So you can or try getting into the English channel and having probably a hard conversation trying to get you, uh, the, let the other people know what you are trying to say, or give up and move to another project, or move to another tool, or, or lose a lot of time troubleshooting. Being able to explain in your own words the problem is key for building a, a huge community as Kubernetes. So, your site looks promising, your new page is there, next step. Uh, well, this is how it looks locally. Okay. You, when you spin Lugo, you get uh, the server prompt uh, in that port, and you can see it's the same web page, but locally. Um, uh, right. Also, for seeing that, if you need to read the documentation offline, you can spin up the Hugo server and read the same thing as it is online, with all the content, with all the format, with all the examples. So, uh, your page looks promising and is ready to, to go to the 1.2 million page. Uh, make a pull request. How you can make a pull request? When you push to your branch, um, GitHub will know that upstream is the, your target. 
So we'll show you uh, a button, this one, to start the pull request process. The, cool rep the pull request will um, try to merge your changes into upstream and will provide um, a process of validation to go to all the, the steps required to get things public pub published. First thing you will find probably, the, the Linux Foundation Contributor License Agreement. Kubernetes is an open source project. Uh, I think currently is under the Apache 2.0 license, but the foundation covering uh, protecting Kubernetes to keep the project open source and agnostic from any provider is the Clonity Foundation. That is an, a sub-project of the Linux Foundation. So your code or your contributions need to be subject to those agreements as a company or as an individual. So if you are already in the, in the Linux Foundation, you will get a, a, green, a green bar. Otherwise, you will get this error. Of, and if you click in details, you will see, you will get like redirected to this page and you will find like the license that you are going to sing and, and all the process required to, to fulfill. There are two types of licensing, uh, contributor as individual or as a company. If your company uh, has, for example, a team of open source contributors, you need to go to the corporate license to cover anyone from your company to push into Kubernetes. If you are a, an individual contributor, it's another document that uh, it's okay. It's only your contributions as company or as an individual will go to the same process. Uh, you can read, it's, it's a pretty straightforward, but it's required to keep Kubernetes open source. Otherwise, if you don't sync this and make a contribution, you can break um, the agreement of the Linux Foundation. So, uh, you registered. Uh, you are a member of the Cloudline Foundation um, and you signed the, the contributor license agreement. Next thing, Netify will kick in and deploy your site in this ephemeral environment. As you can see, is deploy preview and the pull request number. And every time that you make a new commit, this site will be rebuilt. So you can check how it looks in the, in the real page before merging. This will allow the reviewers to kick in and the approvers to kick in and check if everything looks promising. Um, the reviewer process is managed by the bot again, Kubernetes uh, bot will choose between the pool of reviewers uh, to members and will assign this, this job because contributing requires some commitment, but it's to be expected. You need to be part, be constant, be, be there. So if you are a reviewer, you need to go through this process. As always, it's a best effort. If you can, you can uh, set a uh, select another reviewer Start with the sick, and there is no problem. But try to get uh, your your part done. Um, is the reviewer process can be sometimes can be long. Uh, if if it's just if it's your first contribution, you need like to get used to how uh, the style of documentation works, um, the agreements and um, the glossary we follow, and so don't feel um, like you are not uh, good enough if you see like a long review process. It's common. And the second one will, will be better. And the third one will be better. And the fourth one probably you will be the reviewer. So don't worry of having hard time the first time. We are here to help and nobody knows everything from, from the start. Um, so far, any question? Any, how it looks? Yeah? Okay. Um, if you, another good thing of review process is that you learn a lot. As, as I told you before, um, maybe something is obvious to you, but it's not that obvious for anyone. So having more people involved through three reviewers to the process will allow you to improve your understanding of that particular concept. 
even you can be wrong and put a thing that is not true. And giving the, this discussion between members can help you a lot on improving your knowledge of this particular subject. If everything looks good, you will get this label from, from the reviewers. This means looks logic to me, meaning that the reviewer go to all the process and confirms that the document is correct, fulfills uh, the style guide of the six docs, is well written, is, can be is easy to read, and fits into the, the web page. After having a couple of look, look legit to me, the approver will kick in and run again all the process and check that the document is good, is correct, fulfills, and the discussions during the, the review process match the code of conduct. Porque, because it's really important, the code of conduct. Being able to run a, a 3,000 contributors committee, it's hard and requires to be very, very clear about the code of content that we require to fulfill. Otherwise, it will be hard to be able to manage all the minorities, all the individuals, all the people with different levels of understanding. So be sure that you, full, you keep the code of conduct um, valid. If the, reviewer, if the approver rev uh, approves your, your pull request, that's all. The bot will kick in, will build the artifact for the site with, with your changes, and after five minutes of uh, content delivery catching expiration, you will see your page there. In the, remember, one two point millions website. Again, one two point millions is out of people. A lot of people from a lot of companies, uh, a, a lot of companies, a lot of countries, and English is not the most spoken language in the world. It's the most common in the in this uh, kind of tech environment, but it's the fourth, I think, in the world. Uh, I have some numbers here in my notes. Chinese, the first one, one thousand more than 1,000 million speakers. 20% of the population speaks English, uh, Chinese, 20%. That's a lot. And it's not the main language of, the, as you see before, it only covers 200 pages from 1,000. That's a problem. And we need to solve this problem. The next one is Spanish, with four, yeah, 460 million speakers. 6% of the population. And knowing English is not binary. There is a spectrum. And we will go into details afterwards. And the third one, English. The, 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 the common one, the, the native language for technology. But it's not the native language for the, for the planet. So we need to put some effort on opening the community to all the countries in the world. Localizing has two steps. The first one is internationalization. I, I've been training this world a lot. <laughs> um, that means making the site or the tool or the application um, compatible with multi-language, because it's not built in. Uh, I was talking uh, yesterday with the folks from the control line interface uh, group, the kubectl, 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 and it supports English, uh, it supports localization. It currently has a Korean implemented. So if you want to join or start working on code, you can go to the 6 CLI and start getting uh, kubectl written in Spanish. And again, a lot of people use kubectl. Who, who many from here use kubectl? Seeing your code in a tool that is used by millions of people, it's, it's, a, it's a good like, checkpoint in, in your, your profile. Next step, um, localizing is not only translating. Yeah, you have a lot of machine learning algorithms that are able to put things in, look in a dictionary hash map 
and replace things. And yeah, and look into phrases and try to get more sense and find to find uh, false friends and all that. But that's not the point of localizing documentation. The point here is to having content reach more people as possible. And that means that you have, as a native speaker of a language, you need to explain the things in your language, thinking in your language. It's not only copy pasting um, words, need some thought. This, and not only like using your language as efficient as possible and using the tools that your particular language provides to, to, to speak. Also taking account culture fit. Uh, Phrases that maybe are a problem in some countries or that can be misleading or are false friends. You have to put a lot of, of, of thought in, in, the, in the translation. And yeah, R requires human intervention because localization is the, the way to share knowledge between humans, not between a computer and a human. It's a human read some content to allow another human have the same knowledge or learn the same thing. So we don't, we have, we cannot forget this thing. I've been talking about why it's important localizing, localization with a lot of people here in this, in this conference and in Telegram, in Slack, in other channels. Uh, for us it's easy as an end users to use English because well, we have like, the possibility during our scholarship to learn the language and go through, and we are confident with reading English. But that's the case for only 10% probably of the community. The other 90% probably doesn't speak Spanish, uh, English or has problems understanding English. So we need to think on them and not only on us. Because I, I know what I'm reading. I, I, I can't. I could avoid for me if I been if I was selfish, I could not do this uh, and keep living my life and going through because I am able to understand the content. But we need to think on everyone else because this is a community. Kubernetes is in this situation thanks to the community, and that's the main driver of Kubernetes, not only the tool. The tool is amazing; it's brilliant. But the community is what makes Kubernetes what it is, and. I was telling you about binaries. You can have a good understanding of English and just ignore your main language documentation, but you can also be in the middle. So read the English documentation, and if something doesn't look right, you can go back and fail back to your language and improve your language or improve even the English. I think that, as Zach can confirm, is after starting all these localizations, we improved a lot the English documentation because we have like thousands of reviewers from different countries for the, when, with different levels of English understanding, with different culture, and all this feedback improves the original documentation. So it's not only for the minorities of the, the local communities of the language community, it's also good for the upstream community. And, and in the last, in the last uh, um, in the opposite side of the spectrum, you have people that doesn't know English, and they only can start working on Kubernetes or of the tooling if the tools is in, are in their language. Currently, we have these uh, well, uh, eight languages. You can see uh, German, Spanish, French, uh, Hindu, Hindi, Indonesian, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, and Chinese. And all those languages have, have been born, I think, in the last three, four months. Uh, Portuguese started with Felipe, that was aware that Spanish local, uh, localization project was starting, and he jumped in. I jumped in thanks to Remy Leon from, from the French documentation that helped me a lot to get things started. So keep the, if you have a language that is not here, feel free to start a new project to get Get in touch with, with me, with Zach, or any other fall from the six doc, and ask for help. You can also check the, um, the initial pull request that we made during, during our starting of the, you will see all the documents that are required for the initial, all the conversation that we have with current SIGDOC owners 
about how we did things. You can see also, um, we have a, a website, uh, a section only for starting localization. So feel free to get your language here and, and be part of the community and build a community uh, around documentation. Because as I told you before, the most important thing in Kubernetes is the community. I, I, I won't get tired of the, uh, repeat this phrase as <laughs> uh, Zach about having more technical reviews. It's important. And contributing to Kubernetes is not only about code. It's about building a community. This is a, um, a slide from Nikita. Do you remember? The amazing folks that were uh, in the keynote yesterday talking about how they started. But that is what is Kubernetes, a community. So thanks to the, be, be graceful with the people that get into the, the, the community. Provide feedback, provide support. Fulfill the code, be helpful. Um, make constructive criticism. Um, participate in the discussion. As I said, Six Docs is the largest group in Kubernetes. So jump into the Zoom meetings, jump into the Slack like, like channels, not only in your language. I've been working a lot with the Hindi channel uh, um, thread, uh, well, group that is, and I have no idea of Hindi, but I have a lot of things to share about localizing, about reading phrases of, in English and getting the, the core concepts of, of each one. So don't be afraid of get involved in, in the other parts of the SIG. And it's not only the website. Kubernetes has thousands of ways to get uh, into the community. You have the Discord channel. You have the Slack uh, overflow tag. You have um, Twitter. You have um, a lot of ways to be part of your language. Uh, last month, we started the regional discussions and we added Spanish. If you have something to share, go there and start a thread. Um, it's important to build community around language, so you, have, you can have regular discussions in Spanish in the Slack channel, not only in the English channel, as we are seeing right now. Use your language in, in the Slack channels. Don't try to enforce English. There are a lot of people there. 6% of the population is in Spanish, so use your language in the community, not just English. And I think we are doing a lot lately in, in Barcelona. Uh, I run, I organize the Clown Native Barcelona Meetup right now, and the one-to-one -one interaction is also important. Kubernetes is a huge community, it's around the world, and it's mostly digital. But sometimes you need to feel the connection, uh, or you need to help the people get involved in one-to-one -one interaction. Because when you enter in the Slack channel and you see 66,000 members, it can be a bit overwhelming to like just say hi. So help those folks that are more um, shy, or, or and for example, we, so far we run those two types of events. One for learning, one for contributing. And we try to get small groups, like 20 people at most, because the most important thing is, is the, the transition and the contribution. It's fancier to have a 60 uh, group of people working, but if you want to have a good interaction with the people, you need to be close, and you need to have few people. And there are thousands of meetups around the world. Uh, I was talking with uh, Felipe from the, from the Portuguese documentation. He's living in London. So it's hard for him to run this kind of event. But if you go to Meetup, to the Cloud Native Meetup, you will see that our meetups are around the world. So get in touch with the organizer. Send him a mail. Or just try to get in contact with the Cloud Native Foundation. And he, they probably will provide some feedback, some contacts in the local communities to allow you to run these kind of events from London. Uh, I also working in the Contributor Experience SIG, that, and we are trying to build a framework for these kind of events. So provide the slide deck, provide the, like, the script to go forward, the, all the demo applications that we run, all the YAMLs, everything, to share this knowledge, because you don't have, it, 
to keep your knowledge inside you. Knowledge is meant to be shared. It's critical. All the, it's not good to keep everything to you, to be the golden weapon of your company or of your community. The most important thing that you can do is share with others your knowledge and build a community around the knowledge because Kubernetes is what it is thanks to thousands of people. If it was only made by one, two, three people, you, we will get right now a much smaller project, a focus on a particular set of problems that those initial contributors had. So share the knowledge and learn from others because not everything is the way that you think it is. And opening to other folks, other communities, other cultures, other genders, it's important to share and like build a common knowledge. What kinds of, the, of the events we run uh, in, in Kubernetes Barcelona? The first one is Contributor Hackathon. Who went to the Contributor Hackathon from this room? One, two, three, four. So it's working. It's getting people involved. We run, I think, about 22 pull requests in, a, in the same evening. In the same evening. It's important. Yeah, it's a lot of pull requests. But the important thing is people are now inside the community. They already make his pull requests. They know how it works. Some of their pull requests are already in, in, in production, deployed, and accessible to everyone. And after the event, I've been seeing, I, I've seen a lot of new pull requests from the same folks that started that day. So it helps to bootstrap this contribution and then keep, provide support. Uh, be, ask, provide feedback. Ask to them how it's work, it is working. If they are stuck, if they have some problem contributing after the event, talk to six contributor experience. There are a lot of Paris, Nikita, that will help you improve your teaching skills and help you build a better community around your, your local uh, community. Just to be grateful, all the people that came to the event, more than 20. It, an important thing, not all of them are computer scientists. We can he see here Amelia. Amelia is a teacher in, in a public school. And is a Kubernetes contributor, has no idea of Go, has no idea of programming languages, but has a lot of knowledge about teaching. So don't be afraid if you don't know Go or if you don't know Python or you don't know technology at all. At the end, it's language we are trying to solve and localize, we are trying to localize content and teach. So if you are willing to teach, you are welcome to, to contribute to documentation. And everyone is able to teach. Everyone, from the most expert one to the most junior one. So don't be afraid of, of contributing. And not only to documentation, to content, also um, teach Kubernetes to, to the folks in your community. We run a series of study jams. Who went to the study jams? Two, two of them. Um, 20 people, it's like a, a good fit. From 20 people, two are there, uh, are here, sorry. So what we, what we do? We get a concept, for example, pods, and we spend two hours, two and a half hours, talking only about pods in a discussion. So we get a concept. We ask to the folks that came. Everyone makes his point and tries to solve the problem. Then we try to get it done. If it fails, we try to explain why it fails. If it works, we move to the next concept. Last week, we did um, the same thing, but for replica sets. Two and, a half, two and a half hours talking about replica sets. We had, I think, more than 45 examples. Uh, and the script is in, in GitHub. I will show you uh, everything that I use, because all I do is public in GitHub, everything. Everything, even the things that I use for me, my platform, my code, everything is public. So you can hack me or you can use to, to, to build your own project. And we will try to run these series as long as it takes. If we need to spend five hours talking about replica sets, 
it's okay. I learned a lot about replica sets during uh, working on this on this uh, series. And the important thing is learning and keeping the the pace that the people need. And that's the most important thing. You teach to allow other people to learn. The important people are the others, not you. So take your time. Uh, if you need help, if you want to get thing, this, this thing started, I will be more than happy to help. And that's all. Any question? You have the slides here uh, in, the, in the event. Any question? Go ahead. Let's get you the mic. Thank you very much. Another, sorry, on other platforms, when, for example, Microsoft has put a lot of effort into internationalization and translation of the content and the tools, as you said before with kubectl, it yeah. could be translated. But that also raises the problem that if you need to find some if you need to look into Stack Overflow to find the solution to, to solve your problem, then you cannot take advantage of the error message. Uh, have you think about how that is going to impact into, into the user experience or developer experience or operations mm. experience? I'm not. Uh, can, you, uh, can you ask the same thing in Spanish? Yeah, I get your question. So uh, the question is, if you translate uh, the, uh, a tool like Kubectl, how will you manage allowing people to keep looking uh, for this? Because it's only words in your language. You, you won't be able to find anything. Um, you cannot uh, internal, uh, uh, translate everything. For example, you will use Kubectl apply, Kubectl div, Kubectl node, the replica set. I think that in, in documentation, everything that is from the Kubernetes namespace is written in the Kubernetes in the same way, in the English in this case, because you will use the tools that way. When we say about localizing this tool chain, it's help messages. So if you run kubectl apply and you get an error message, that error can be in Spanish, or can be both. You can say like, okay, let's make both. Or you can like have a flag and get the language, the, the, the same error in English if you want. But the, the thing is that if you are in Spanish and you get a, a message in Spanish about what, what was the problem, maybe you can fix the problem right away instead of going to Google Translate or to the Stack Overflow. So the thing is making easier, not changing the language. But that is really, is, it's not useful at all, like change the verbs or the actions of the tool chain, because it's hard. And not all the languages have the same word. And I think that it is not the problem we are trying to solve. The problem that we are trying to solve with internationalization is to help the users that if they have a problem, they can get better understanding because the, the error is written in their language. The help, for example, if you say help, and get the English word, but at the side, the explanation of what does in Spanish, I think it's more than enough for you. That solves your problem? Your question, sorry. Other questions? Uh, from the room, who, my, who many of you will be, want to join to documentation today or tomorrow? You, I can wait. Yay! Great. Um, so thank you all for coming and see you around. Thank you so much, everyone.